Hello there. Welcome once again to Delight Channel. It's a pleasure to have you here this week. Last week, we focused on the dichotomy between your technical skill and your behavioral skill as you climb the ladder in your organization. I hope that you found that video very useful. And I think it's a good time to let you know that one of the things you need to do, in addition to the few things I'm sharing with you, to become a successful leader is that you must be a reader. Readers are leaders. Now, I, I'm not recommending any particular author to you, but I've read a couple of very interesting titles myself. And I just want you to be hungry for knowledge and just go after knowledge. You can't do wrong if you read books from Stephen Covey, for, from Jim Maxwell, from Simon Sinek, Patrick Lencioni, Jim Collins. Every one of them have their own perspective to this conversation and then um, they will enrich your position as you go on. So, indirectly what we are saying is that now a group of people have been handed over to you. <laughs> It is now your job on how you are going to turn them into a team. And therefore today, my focus moves to the issue of team management. When I say team management, I'm talking about a couple of things. I'm talking about how do you select your team? I'm assuming sometimes you have the opportunity of selecting your team. But typically when you are starting out, and usually in most organizations, you are not 100% in charge of your team but i will still spend some time to speak about team selection and then team formation how do you make sure, how do you move it from being a group to a team and then performance evaluation i will not be able to dwell too in i will not be able to go into too much detail on performance evaluation if you need more material on that you can contact me directly but i will try and share enough that makes it easy for you to understand what I'm talking about. So, team selection. Let's for a moment assume that you have the opportunity and the freedom to choose the people that are going to be on your team. Who will you pick? I'm not asking you for names, but what type of people would you like to have on your team? Are you going to be looking for everybody who looks like you, thinks like you, acts like you, agrees with you? or you want to be the biggest dog in the kennel so you are going to be looking for people that do not know as much as you do if you will truly become a great leader a few things will have to come into your game number one is that you must be open to accommodate people who are not like you there are different literature out there that speaks about the types of people you need for a product or a company or an idea to succeed and you will find out that even the pessimist, even the doubter, even the, the guy who, who is always criticizing, they have a role in the team, provided they know how to manage it well. Because that little detail you are overlooking, it may be that pessimist guy that's going to find it for you. That little thing you are taking for granted, it may be your critic that's going to point it out. What am I saying? I'm not saying that you should go and assemble a group of cantacaros people that can never work together. All I'm saying is that a major responsibility you have is to ensure that you have a good mix of individuals and their personality in the team. The better the mix, the better the chances of that team, of that group becoming a team. So, also, it's usual sometimes for leaders to want to be to think that they are they are right to leadership and that position is predicated upon their being the brightest the smartest the one that has all the ideas and any idea that does not come from the boss is a bad idea that cannot fly if that is how you are thinking you are either very wrong or you've got the wrong team it has to be one of the two you must deliberately seek people who are more brilliant, who are smarter, who are more rounded than you. And your reputation as a leader, remember, 
is not defined by what you can do by yourself alone. You are actually measured by the output of your team. And I think that's something you must never forget. The day you become a leader, let me say it more succinctly. The day you become a leader, your valuation and evaluation is not based on what you can do by yourself alone. It is based on what you are able to deliver with the team. If that sinks with you and you agree with that, then it becomes a no-brainer that the brighter the brains you can find and bring onto your team, the better for you as a leader. So don't be afraid to just sit back and let the brilliant people contribute. Don't feel threatened. Don't feel out of place. Your job is not to find a way of forging those ideas together, making sure that as they have come up with the brilliant ideas, they can stay on course to finish. In fact, I used to say that the job of the leader is to clear the wrong way for the flight to take off. And to then stay behind and pick up all the pieces to make sure that something they didn't uh, pay attention to does not become a problem in the future. That's your role. So don't think that you have to be the only one generating the idea. And then everybody has to keep quiet when the boss is speaking. Check it very well. If that is how your team is running right now, you are probably a dictator or a manager at best, but certainly not a leader. So, in forming your team, be open to differences. One of my friends used to tell me that being different is not the same as bad. Be open. Bring in different people. Listen to all of them. Find a way of complementing their skills, their temperaments one with another, such that at any point in time, the mix will always give you the potent force that you require to make your objective achievable. But up till now, if you are not careful, all that you have may just be a group. What does it take to create a team? What does it take to turn a group into a team? In fact, what is the difference between the two? Just in case you don't know, a group is just an assembly of people Everybody with his own idea, with his own opinion, his own agenda, they don't necessarily have to agree. They don't necessarily have to be committed to anything. They are just by happenstance together and that is it. But when you use the word team, it means that there is an overarching goal. There is a vision that everybody in that team is committed to, they understand their role in achieving that goal and they are ready to do whatever they need to do to achieve the goal. And we are not playing with words, it's a big difference between group and team. And there is an acronym somewhere out there that says that team stands for together for T, everybody for E, achieves for A, and more for M. So, how do you turn that group of people, how do you turn them into a team? Management science says there are five stages in team formation. And why do you need to know these five stages? Because he helps you as a leader to know where the team is and then be able to respond appropriately. Because where the team is determines what you should be doing. What are the five stages? The first one is forming. You know how in local parlance we say it's forming for me. Everybody comes together. Everybody is trying to be nice and polite. Everybody stays out of conflicts, no trouble. But before you know it, conflict begins to arise. And that is where the storming phase happens. And then everybody is trying to assert themselves. No, I want it like this. No, I see it like this. No, I believe it like that. And before you know it, there are clashes of hair, there are clashes of opinion, and then it becomes a battle. From there, if the team can survive, now, this is very important, and this is one of the critical role of a leader, because if you don't get the group to survive the storming phase properly, and believe me, it's a skill. Some can, can come out of the storming stage very high to perfect, some are very low to imperfect 
and where you end determines what goes on every 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 step of the way but if they are able to come out of the storming phase successfully what then happen they begin to build norms standard which is why we call it the norming stage what are the agreed rules what happens when people come late for meetings what happens when you don't answer your call what happens when your delivery is late everybody discuss everybody agrees everybody commits whether you like it or not but there is a there is a consensus by the majority of the team to say these are the norms these are the rules with which we are going to run in this team once you get to the norming stage it's now a team on steroids they begin to perform the energy that went into the storming phase where they were fighting with one another mm. goes into the productive engagement they begin to bring out their best bring out their creativity as long as those norms are holding you can find a very high performing and what is why is this important to you as a leader what you need to do during the storming phase is different from what you need to do in the norming phase what you need to do in the norming phase is different from what you need to do in the performing phase and the last leg is the adjoining where either you move on you dismantle the team and the team is done and they have to move on to something else so in the next video i will try and dwell a little more on this to let you see when a team is in the storming phase what is the role of the leader if a team is in the norming phase what is the role of the leader and then what happens to the leader when you have a very performing team you'll be shocked as to how different your role is in these various phases and i hope i'll be contributing something to your success as a leader in the workplace like us share comment we need to know that you are there so that we can keep going knowing that we are actually making a difference the conversation continues next week Tim Mark is still my name and never ever forget that all i'm trying to do is what make a little difference see you next week ciao ciao